air conditioning was a necessity during the many coal lessent summer months at Fort Sill, the stifling heat and humidity would search out the motorized vehicles utilized for transportation. The 5-ton missile test station, a stationary presence when cabled for operation, accommodating numerous telemetry test panels, oscilloscopes, evaluating redoubt platforms and screens, all consisting of vacuum tube operated circuitry, requiring a prostrate of lower temperatures to sustain tolerance levels, air conditioning an absolute requirement. A quandary developed among the ranking personnel members of the firing battery when Gary was approached by the warrant officer. Inquiring about security and a judge to enforce a previous disregarded regulation. The test van by directive was allocated to staff having secured a secret clearance, which were officers and certain accessing personnel. But Gary's and his co-worker PFC Clark had adhered to their predecessor's disregard, allowing all firing battery NCO and Gary's nemesis. Spec 5 Crow to access the van and partake of the air-conditioned atmosphere. Upon manifestation of circumstance, a change was initiated. Many of the line staff the NCOs and others were not happy, as they could no longer experience a brief escape from the heat or help themselves to the presence of a coffee pot. The 2nd Missile Battalion 80th Artillery was deployed to the West Range on a setup station adjacent to a 8 inch howitzer battery. The ground vibrating, sending the visible 200 pound projectiles hurtling across the expanse. During the multi fold field exercises, a sense of competition prevailing between the two missile firing battery platoons, on the time it would take to cable up, test, and certifying the missile's acquisition. Gary discerning that his and Clark's competitive counterparts in the first firing battery test van were E-5, journeymen of the old 246th. To exceed their proficiency would require a marked attempt by the younger two of the second firing battery. Cabling completed, Clark opening the thick procedure manual preparing to read the power-up agenda a step-by-step -step checklist to verify all testing equipment was activated and functioning correctly. Gary intervening, mentioning the procedure was still indelibly imprinted from his daily test station powering up at school. The PFC beginning to activate the procedure from memory, accelerating the equipment to an online status. Clark voicing a disapproval but acknowledging that the equipment was up and running in half the time. The shortened procedure time didn't win the competition, the more experienced first firing battery test station technicians were more seasoned. Gary concluding not to use the memory power-up procedure again, reasoning that expediency should only trump deliberation in competing sporting events. Payback was suspect. The firing battery having blundered with Clark and Gary. Failing to issue a weapons upon their arrival, both remaining silent about this anomaly. Once a month at 1600 hours, always on a Friday, a cleaning and weapon inspection prevailed, but because the two were never issued a weapon, they were exempt from the roster, conveniently disappearing from sight. Spec 5 Crow, Gary's nemesis encountered the discrepancy augmenting the electronic technicians with 30 caliber carbine. Gary mentioning to Crow that they hadn't qualified with the 30 caliber but with the 30 odd 6 M1 Garand in basic training. The E5 wasn't deterred, checking their 201 file, arranging for the two to qualify with the carbine and additionally, the Army holster bearing. Colt 45, a required test van weapons. Crow making arrangements, the two transported to the post small arm firing range, the PFCs with their newly acquired weapons qualifications, not only having their names now posted on the cleaning and weapons inspection roster but serving double duty with two weapons to service for inspection, all to the recreational gratification of Specialist 5 Crow.
the person whom Gary incurred at the service club music room months earlier, making reference to his piano nimbleness had returned. His name was Lauren Glenn Froman, an artillery unit supply clerk and soon to be civilian. Glenn proclaiming music credentials as a lyricist and drummer, having in the past submitted material to various artists before being drafted in Indiana for his military calling. In the service club music room, again questioning the pianist about his music and this time a possible consideration to play the piano with two other musicians in an impromptu session, just to see the possibilities. Gary was content with his monogamous conversation and collaboration with the piano's narrative portraits, but Glenn's question spurred an interest, hesitant but finally accepting his proposal out of curiosity. Having never played with accompanying instruments, and conceivably would enlighten the shadow of a long-standing question concerning a possible sequestered music certainty. Glenn having arranged for the four to meet Sunday afternoon at Chester Burke's Diamond Horseshoe Club, five miles west of Lawton. The club having a piano, Gary being introduced to Jimmy Clay, a rhythm guitar player with a Neil Sedaka repertoire, and Carl Wright, a Korean War sergeant from Fort Sill, Carl a somewhat lead guitar player and vocalist. With the arrival of the two, Glenn on drums, and Gary at the piano, the impromptu session began. Gary finding no difficulty with the simplified chord structure of the commercially popular songs. The session may have been impromptu, but Glenn apparently was an anomalous promoter having arranged to get the four together at a private club with a piano, on a Sunday afternoon and the club owner present. The proprietor was impressed upon hearing the group, making a financial offer. The group agreeing to perform the subsequent Friday and Saturday nights and arranging to get some rehearsal time at the club prior to the weekend. Friday night the impromptu musicians making their debut, Gary abreast of the turn of events and the apparent new direction it was headed. An unexpected page suddenly appearing in the book of life, questioning whether to remain steadfast on his course, or venture down this unexplored path. <laughs>